All right, this is Art131 with Wyndham Graves, and I have uh, Max Gross here today, and we're going to be talking about uh, craft and uh, some of the less art with a capital A making things. Uh, Max, if you'd introduce yourself and give us a little bit of history on who you are and um, what your educational background has been and what you do. Okay, I'll do my best with that. Um, as you already said, my name is Max Gross. I'm living in North Florida. I have been for quite some time. Um, my work history and education history are convoluted, sort of to say the most, or to say the least, I should say. Yeah. Um, I started off getting a degree in uh, baking and pastry arts from the Culinary Institute of America. And that would sort of be the culmination of my traditional education experiences. Um, past that, I have worked in a wide variety of fields and have had uh, spent a lot of time essentially learning various types of uh, crafts and working in arts-related uh, industries and have kind of built up an amalgamation of skills into something that's not really directly marketable in the traditional economy and has kind of left me um, having to figure out how to make craft objects as a way of trying to kind of uh, propel my life forward. That's cool. Um, and, and just for another of uh, more traditional education, you have a, when you got your welding thing, is that a certificate or what was that? Yeah, I attended um, trade school after I got out of culinary school and had moved back to, to Florida initially as a way of basically being able to stay on my parents' health insurance, uh, as you <laughs> all might remember in the bad old days. Oh, yeah. Um, and so that afforded me the opportunity to um, get a little bit more of what I would consider to be at this point in our state non-traditional education in both um, electronics as well as welding over the course of about another three years. Um, those programs were designed basically as workforce development programs and much like the culinary education I had were essentially the exact same things that they were doing for soldiers post World War II and were down and dirty, here's how you get it done, basic techniques, what we're basically doing is giving you everything you need for your future employer to turn you into what they need and get you out in the world as quickly as possible. So they yielded what are considered certificates of completion, which um, I guess in the trades world as it exists today probably means something, but it's a foot in the door more than anything else. It doesn't really necessarily carry any of the weight of a degree from an institution that actually sort of means something. It's, you know, a slip of paper from a, a delightful redneck in North Florida who says I can weld okay. <laughs> well, that's quite the way to put it. Uh, but of course that, uh, that gives you more skills than most people le le leave with a degree with. But uh, we'll talk about oh, that later. Oh, laughable. Let's be real here. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so, so you have a, have what, I think, most of my students would have heard of this as, as technical degrees. I think some people get their AA and kind of do a, a technical degree like that. Um, that would be what the culinary education was. The culinary okay. education yielded uh, what they called an AOS or an Associate of Science. Um, yeah. And that actually is like a degree. It's a real thing, albeit extremely minor. Uh, okay, cool. The, the school also offered a bachelor's that you could get, but it was not worth the time and the money um and it was unaccredited at the time not to say that since it's become accredited it would be worthwhile but they offered that path for people who were really interested in having paper backing their name and and i assume that those people would have just been getting that for the business credentials essentially there's a lot of people who go to something like the culinary institute of america not necessarily because they want to be um a chef or to be an artist or to be an artisan or whatever kind of however you want to conceptualize that those are dangerous words to throw yeah, that's out fine. don't worry about but, it um we're not going to be picky about it today excellent um so there are some people who do it for the craft and there are some people who do it because what they really want to do is to go be a head chef at a big resort and basically get um all of the benefits of being a a white collar professional while still being able to call themselves a chef. and um those are the kinds of folks who are in, aiming for the executive world uh, and okay. for them, having a bachelor's from the Culinary Institute of America might very well be 
meaningful. Also, there were programs that um, existed between the Culinary Institute of America and uh, Cornell. And so the bachelor's program was a pretty easy way to get from the CIA into Cornell if, once again, you were interested in having paper back your name. That makes good sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's really interesting. And that's one thing that I, that I want to kind of stop here and, and say really quickly is that because all of the stuff we're talking about does so... Um, we're going to float around a lot of the edges of the art world and craft world and technical things and sciences and things like that. Uh, I just want everybody listening to realize that uh, the terms we use are going to float quite a bit. Uh, so if, if something um, is yes. being defined today in a way that you don't like or you don't agree with, don't worry. That's just the word we're using for this conversation. Um yeah, just because... Yeah, and I think a lot of these words are very open to critique. Like you said, they're loaded terms for a lot of different people in a lot of different ways, and there's a lot of interesting conversations that can come from that. Um, but I think I would say two th just generally speaking. The first one is, is that I'm traditionally uneducated, so if I say something that seems patently wrong or false to you, that's fine. That's your experience. That's your yeah. education. I'm dealing with what I've learned and what has worked for me i'm kind of like um a hermit edge page <laughs> of these sorts of things i'm just yeah i'm not the guy who went and took the art history classes i don't know what i'm talking about in a lot of places and i'm going to do my best to avoid using specifics and to be very clear about where the edges of my actual knowledge are and like you said a lot of stuff we're going to be talking about are experiential yes. the other thing i would say is is that you may have a word that means something to you in the educational tradition under which you have learned it yep. and that exact same word might mean something completely different in somebody else's world um yep the term q means about eight different things to me depending upon what it is we're talking about if we're talking about <laughs> electronics if we're talking yep. about food if we're talking about business if we're talking about statistics oh, yeah. so bear in mind also that the meaning of the word as we're using it may just be something you're not aware of yet mm -hmm. and if it's bothering you take it as an opportunity to go fact check what we're saying you might learn something or you might find out that we're just talking out of our butts you never know Yep, 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 that's totally true. Yeah, and that's something that, that that we discuss in yeah, class, and I think that it's a really important wow. thing for everybody to understand is that you may have a particular technical term, but if that word does not facilitate communication, then it's not a good word. Um, it, it's Absolutely. much better to have a good conversation where the words aren't quite right as long as everybody understands what's going on. Of course, that changes when you get into technical fields and things like that, and we may get into that a little bit, and I may ask you to define some things um, at some point. But, By all means, uh, yeah. When we get there, we'll get there. Uh, we'll cross that bridge. <laughs> um, okay, so the the I think we should just start talking about um, some specifics, and then we'll get into the more esoteric stuff. Uh, one of your big, I don't, I hesitate to say hobbies, but uh, craft projects is the making of knives, and I think that that's a really good place to start because it's a good mix of uh, aesthetic and technical skill as well as tool making. Um, would you just give me a Absolutely. little bit about why why you dig that quite so much? Well. Um... Let's see. I of haven't actually a made a start. knife in probably three years. Yeah, and that is really where it started was at school having an interest in knowing more about the tools. Now, a quick step back from that, why did I go to culinary school in the first place? Why do I like crafts? Why, why do these things interest me in the first place? Mm -hmm. And that has to do primarily all with the same thing, which is the experience of, in my youth, being exposed to... A lot of antiques and a lot of good culture. I had parents who were doing their best to have their children be cultured, and I had grandparents who were very much a part of the art scene. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, my youth was steeped in having access to or seeing, not necessarily owning, because we were very tenuously middle-class people, but um, having available to me because of where I lived and having people who were plugged into culture to learn a lot about the way things sort of could be. Yep. And I had a lot of gripes even in my um, youth and adolescence about the quality of things that were available to me. Yeah. And so it became incumbent upon me to learn how to make them for, 
for myself. This is why I ended up in culinary school. This is why I ended up wanting to make knives. The um, you know, the reality has not changed at all in the pre-recession world into the new depression world, yeah. most of the things that I want. Um, but I can make a lot of things because I've got hands, and um, I mean that in the old sense of the term, not like literally like I have hands. Obviously, that's that's one thing, but I mean that the way an old union person would say that. Yes. Um, and it was the same thing. The first set of knives that I bought for myself, I bought a Santoku that cost me a little over 100 of a slicing knife that was about $200. And they are fine, fine knives. I still have them to this day. I use them all the time. They're absolutely fantastic. Um, I could afford to do that when I was in college and I had a loan. Uh, I yeah. can't afford to do that as a semi-competent adult who is trying to make it in this world. Yeah. Um, but... But uh, you know what? A strip of steel is not that expensive, and a file isn't that expensive, and I happen to have a little, little drill press already, and a bunch of the other sorts of things associated with it, so one start to find their way. Now, um, it happened to be that while working at uh, a place called the Master Craftsman Studios, I became friends with a gentleman named uh, Bill, who had a also had an interest in blacksmithing and in knife making and he himself had in fact already infiltrated the local florida artist blacksmith and had made friends with another gentleman also named bill who um was sort of the local representative for what we refer to as the southern bladesmiths association and uh by luck would have it that particular guy that bill the second bill was interested in learning how to bake bread which is one of my particular specialties and so over the course of a couple of months, we set up an arrangement whereby I lessons from the kind of local Alta Cocker brigade of people who make knives, and I was baking bread with them, and kind of the rest was history. It gave me access to a forge, it gave me access to um, some institutionalized knowledge that was actually really pretty good, um, informed by the Alabama Forge Council, which is a, one of the really OG um, modern blacksmithing communities around. Um, yeah, um, there's a reason a uh, up in yeah. there's a reason up in Birmingham that there's a big statue of Vulcan. <laughs> oh yeah, and Sloss is near there and all that stuff. Yep. I mean, Alabama's a fantastic place for metalworks. Yeah, um, really interesting stuff happening there. So basically, having access to knowledgeable people and through them the recommendations of resources of places to go and also this. Um, the uh, machinist I um, got to know during my welding class, who was retired, uh, was giving me books that were reprints of blacksmithing manuals from the uh, like mid and eight, uh, early and mid 1800s that oh, were, great. you know, explanations about how to build a bed forge and the proper geometry for uh, the, the chimney so that it drafts correctly and like these insane stories about like, you know, okay, you're a 10 year old boy and you're going to go get your first job um, at, with a blacksmith. And what they're going to be wanting for you to do is basically spending your day using a cold chisel, cutting the heads off of bolts. So if you want to get that job, you should go into there already knowing about the geometry of a cold chisel and how to sharpen one properly and be like mildly conversational about these. And it's just like such a different world than where we live now. Oh yeah. But those things were all just fantastic basis of understanding the, traditions of the craft and also that the differences between what they were doing and what we're doing now are basically those of repeatability and industrial scale yeah but that the reality is that you can yourself basically use any number of a diff a bunch of different crude means including myself most recently literally a harbor freight leaf blower i'm sorry a leaf burner weed burner mm -hmm. to heat up a piece of metal until it's cherry red you can hit it with a hammer until you are roughly satisfied with its shape multiple heatings and then you can use something like a file to um refine that shape and then carve a bevel onto it and eventually an edge um you know before you do that slap a handle on it you have yourself a crude knife mm -hmm. and if you like that process and you do several more of them they're going to get increasingly less crude and eventually you're going to start learning more about the traditional methods the traditional patterns how you might make the, um, what we call now, um, so-called Damascus steel. Uh, you might learn more about crucible steels. You'll learn about the leather work. You'll learn a little bit about woodwork. And you sort of start to cobble together an understanding of um, what a trade at one point really was and how it is that you can use this wealth of information that never would have been available at the time to kind of learn what you need uh, from an individual's 
trade uh, so that it w for what will suit you, you know? And so for me, as much as I like making knives, um, it's not really the primary skill set that I've, I've kind of taken away from doing that. For me, it's really turned into more of a tool making uh, affair than really a knife making affair for the most part. Yeah, so you're making those objects in order to be tools for you and closely related other people. Um, not so much just doing it for that to be the object that sits in a cabinet. Right, and so, and this kind of, I think, starts to get at, like, the the thing about craft that's so interesting is that, you know, if it's not, you can make a knife into something that, you know, people might be able to argue about the relative artistic merits of or whatever. It's really yeah. what you're doing is you're creating, you're trying to create a craft artifact, you know. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. If you pick it up and it won't cut paper or it won't cut meat or do whatever the hell it is that the knife was designed to do, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. It just becomes an ornament. It loses its context of the self if it's not rooted. You know, if you're making something that's an homage to an object, then it still has to be that object, even if there's something about it that would make it perhaps not the most reasonable functional item or whatever. You know, a, um, yes. an artistic bowl is something a good example of this, or an artistic spoon. It's basic, yeah. Something that takes it, gives it a little bit more than just what's required to make it happen. Right, and there's a number of ways by which we can sort of get to that, and ornamentation is one that's really commonly used um, in the West. Other things that kind of come along with that is more the, the idea of making a lot of them, getting really good at being able to make them, and that with your developed skill and your freedom of expression in what it is you're doing, sort of letting the um, artistic object create itself. 150, 200 knives, one or two of them are going to be something really special. It doesn't oh, necessarily see. require you to have tried to do it. Um, you know, they're not all going to be. You would try to create beautiful objects, but some of them are going to be excellent. Yeah, some of them are going to be excellent, and some of them just are going to be okay. Um, yeah, and if you're if you're really good, you'll beat the standard bell curve. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> you'll you'll beat the odds on how many really excellent ones you make. Um, that's exactly. really cool, and um, I want to go back a little bit to uh, you were talking about how by making knives you got into, or you kind of have to get into all this other stuff, and that's something that I've found in, in my hobbies and craft and activities and art making as well, is that really once you get into something, you just realize how little you know about everything that's related, and how... Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. And how how much effort and time it takes to make that right, and um, I don't know where I'm going with that. Hang on. Uh, so what I want to talk about with that is is just kind of the the natural exploration that goes into that, and um, you described it a little bit with um, with the knife making of going into woodworking and leatherworking, and can you just give a, a very slight narrative that kind of links all of those craft types together so you are sitting in your garage you have a chunk of steel and a file take me take, mm -hmm. take me through the story of learning everything else to make that into a knife that i have in my kitchen right right now so, so uh, just to kind of we'll take this through like i'm going to call this as politely as i can kind of like an idiot's progression yes perfect um, that's exactly what i want you've got you've got this chunk of steel right and at the most basic like you said you've got a file and you you carve it more or less into the shape of an um the next sort of iteration of that would be actually forging it which um there's a ton of advantages to but that's sort of irrelevant to this whole conversation either way um what you've done essentially is created a knife shaped object made out of steel Mm -hmm. And let's say you've gone ahead and you've done the um, the heat treating on it so that it's, uh, for all intents and concerns, a knife, except it's dull and it has no handle. Okay. Um, so and you don't nice really have anything, piece of metal. any way to like move it around. Yeah. Right. So the first thing you might do is sharpen it if you were just really excited and not thinking because, you know, you've got a knife, right? And uh, it's really uncomfortable to hold because the handle's really thin and the edges of it are kind of sharp. Um, 
So now what are you going to do with it, right? It's hard to use and you can't store it properly. So let's say you've taken this another step forward and you've decided, okay, I would like for this thing to be comfortable to hold. Um, I'm going to put some sort of handle on it. I'm going to put some sort of, you know, you can, uh, you could basically carve the existing handle down into what we call a tang, which is sort of a, a tapered thin section. And you could heat it up and drive it into a piece of wood, um, which once again, you might then consider the relative merits of carving into something pleasant to hold on to. As opposed um, to just you a could also bar of wood. like a chunk of wood that yeah. you happen to find, you know, something. Uh, I mean, really, at the most basic, what you would think about for that is finding a branch um, or a section of tree, like a crotch section or something that had a naturally appealing handle shape. That would be really the most basic way of doing it and then burning it in. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say once again, we're just we're haphazardly going through this. We want to make a knife and we're not thinking about steps two, three or four. We're just doing the next thing. Right. Yeah. So um, the other options, of course, would be what we refer to as scales. So if you have what's called in knife terminology a full tang, which is to say that the um, part of the blade that isn't the blade continues all the way down through the handle at the same um, relative height as what the handle will be. So the entirety of the thing that you hold on to contains metal, for lack of an elegant way of yes. putting that. Um, and so you could use thinner pieces of wood. Instead of a chunk of wood, you could use thin pieces of wood or... Various other things have been used throughout the ages, including bone and turtle scales and various things like that, um, to once again plastic. make it so that this... No. Oh yes, plastic and um, just like in almost every other field, somehow epoxy resin um, has made its way to everything. So like micarta oh, yeah. is one of the big things that people like, which is, you know, fabric and resin. Yep. Um, so it's very, I mean, the stuff is very long lived. It's just um, ugly and has no soul. So, I mean... If you like it, that's fine. That's just my opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be right, a lot so of now we've gotten... expressed today. <laughs> oh, I, if I am nothing if not an expression of a lot of opinions. Uh, so now you've got a decent handle and you have a knife. And once again, you go, okay, now it's safe to sharpen it because I put a handle on it. It's not just going to be this clumsy object to hold. And you might really be happy with it at that point. And let's say... You're so pleased with it that you want to give it to somebody who you care about. You think, this is a really nice thing that I've made. I would like to give this to my father. I'd like to give this to my mother. I'd like to give this to my sister. Whatever. Um, I've given a couple of my sister-in-law's knives as gifts when they've graduated from college, for instance. The um, problem is, if you just hand them a knife, what are they going to do with it? I mean, is it a kitchen knife? Is it going to go live in a drawer? Um, do you want them to have the ability to carry it with them? Do you want them to have the ability to just safely store it somewhere? Mm -hmm. If so, now you need some kind of a sheath. You need some sort of a scabbard. Um, and once again, there are a number of answers to this if you look in sort of like what people have done. And the easiest is to make some sort of a sheath, usually out of leather. Because honestly, carving a scabbard is a really big pain in the butt. <laughs> um, it involves just a lot more tools, a lot more work. And uh, at the end of the day, even though leather is a little bit of a pain to work with, punching holes in it and hand sewing is just not that hard. Um, and carving a scabbard and inletting it for the blade and making it fit properly and all that other stuff is hard, and it also yields a larger, more unwieldy object, even if it is very pretty when they're done well. Yeah. So a lot of people just end up getting into making a sheath. And, you know, once again, what's the most basic sheath? It's you take a piece roughly to the profile of the knife, a little bit bigger, you fold it in half, and you sew the edge, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe put a belt loop on it if you're thinking about it. And, you know, once again, we're just filing the knife down from the uh, from the piece of steel we have an approximation of the entire process at this point and what's wonderful about that even though it's extremely crude is that now you know what the process is and there are a bunch of you can look at refining so what of the process did you enjoy what of the process was perhaps not so great was it not so great because you just didn't really like working with the material like as much as I work with wood, I just really don't like sanding very much. So I do everything I can <laughs> to avoid having to do it. And a lot of that just involves using my tools more intelligently. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, there's there's things to be considered. Leather work has got a whole bunch of pains associated with it as well. But um, you get better at those things if they're important to you. Or um, in the case of like one of the uh, my earlier knife mentors, he hated leather work. So he just paid other people to do it. And if yeah. that's you know, an option that's available to you that sometimes is really good because um, I can make a decent sheath and I can make a decent leather bag and I can do a bunch of things with leather and it's something that at some point I will continue to advance my skill set on. But at the same time, 
there are people who can do a lot better job than I can. And if I'm going to um, be in the process of trying to sell, and I'm going to use that, I say that very specifically because I have other thoughts for other ventures. But if your goal is capitalism, yeah. um, then there's sometimes a lot to be said for paying somebody to do a better job than you can faster. Um, but yeah, you do that, have to understand that, 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 that has its costs. They might also be able to do it faster and cheaper than you can do it faster. There are often times where you can oh, buy absolutely. a finished I mean, object for less than the raw materials. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's uh, We're inundated with that in the world. And the yeah. other thing to keep in mind is that the value of time is an extremely fluid thing. And it is very easy to say that your time is not worth anything because maybe you don't have a job or you feel like you don't have anything to do or whatever. And there's a lot of times where that might be true. Like tool making is a perfect example of it. It might take a fair amount of time to get what it is. But if, you know, what is, um, it's not, not an issue if you're just sitting around doing nothing. But at the same time, time can be extremely valuable. And if you're not sitting around doing nothing, but you actually have either a craft you're trying to hone or a skill you're already good at in which you're being productive or any number of other permutations, then your time actually becomes a extremely valuable you might think about the fact that you know at a baseline in our society time is worth roughly ten dollars an hour should be worth more than that but it kind of is roughly worth ten dollars an hour right now yeah you know so what do you what's the best use of it yep yeah and i think that that's something that's really important is that kind of when we're exploring these hobbies and crafts that we consider paying ourselves um and, oh yeah yeah and and even if you're not paying yourself actually you're not you know taking ten dollars out of your right pocket and putting it in your left pocket um you're just adding that into the equation when you're thinking about what tools you should buy and whether or not it's worth it to buy a tool that saves you time um and things like that and that's an important thing especially for young people and this is a trap that i've fallen into untold numbers of times is how many hours I will spend trying to do something with the wrong tool as opposed to just going oh, out yeah. and buying the right tool. Um, yes. When, so so that let me just ask you that. Um, at what point, and while we're having this conversation, I'm actually sitting here playing with one of your knives and leather holsters because uh, it sits on my desk. Um, uh, but... A little wooden knife. <laughs> um <laughs> Yes, how incredibly dangerous. Um, <laughs> but um, so, so at what point do you say, all right, it's worth it to go get the right tool as a, as a person who you're in your early 30s like I am, and um, are you like me and where it, it's only a few minutes before it's time to go get the right tool now? Or, or do you like to bash your head against it? Or do you like to build the tools? Because that's also an option that both you and I have is that for um, quite a few of the, of the crafts and hobbies that we pursue, we can make a certain extent of our own tools. Oh, yeah. Um, so it really it varies a fair amount and it depends upon what it is I'm doing. If I'm new to something, I am liable to spend more time than I should kind of just bashing my head against the wall. But usually it's because of the fact that I bought what I thought was the right tool and not had it been the right tool. So I usually want to just really understand the contours of my problem and what the limitations of my current tool set are. Well, and the sunk cost fallacy is um, coming to bite you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, do I really want to do this? <laughs> oh, secondarily, like you said, I'm in my, my early mid-30s at this point, and I have been doing this for my, my entire adult life in some respect, and so I actually have a lot of tools already. So a lot of times it's a question of, um, in terms of beating your head against the wall, like I have a lot of permutations I can go through of what the right tool might be before mm -hmm. I'd arrive at the idea that I simply don't have it. Yeah. Because um, there are a lot of tools that can be used in a lot of different ways and, and that can accomplish a lot of purposes. Uh, skiving leather is a good example of it. You can buy a tool to do that, and it works way better than any of the tools that I have, but I also can use a flat chisel and accomplish the same thing. What is skiving leather? Um, Explain. So, Nobody knows what that word means. Skiving is... Um, 
basically thinning out. So one of the issues you run into really quickly with Leathercraft is that it's thick. Even thin leather has a fair amount of thickness to it as compared to something like fabric. Yeah. And so when you start folding over or having multiple layers, you can start to get these monstrously thick edges that you really don't want to sew through. Mm -hmm. And so the way by which you deal with that is to thin out the edges of your project ah. so that um, you get these nice tapered lines and that it's not you know just murder on either your hands or a machine or whatever you've got to actually do the joining work. And um, it's a big pain in the butt. And there's a nice little tool. It's called like a safety skiver or something like that. It's like all of $12. And it um, holds a basically like a scalpel type blade, a little bit long, longer and thinner at a uh, angle and lets you just shave it right off. Uh, and it's very, very easy to use. Um, and for the, you know, 15 combined dollars with shipping it costs to get you get it. It's worth yeah, worth it. Um, I mean, it's hard to just reproduce that because it's a holder that holds these mechanically produced little blades that are cheap to buy. It's like trying to make a... It's like, are you going to spend a lot of time making a holder for an exact? Yeah. No, probably not. Yeah, just get you an could. exacto knife. Yeah. Um, yeah. It... But you could also just go get an exacto knife. And so that kind of a thing is just like, that's a no-brainer. I don't need to reinvent the wheel on this. The thing that will cause me to do something at that point, like use the chisel, is being broke. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes that $15 is harder to get to than any of us would like to realize, and that's where being innovative with what you have comes into play. And going, okay, I can't afford that thing, but I want to do this. So I have some tools, and it's not the most efficient way of doing it, but I can get it done for this project. And if I really want to do it again, then I'll go spend that. And if I'm lucky, this project will help me get that $15. Probably yep. not, but maybe. Yeah, maybe. Um, so those kind of things. So then on the other end of the of the spectrum is like um, I've picked up uh, one of the, the things I'm studying right now is wood turning. Um, I've got mm -hmm. access to a pretty good mentor on it. And I've got, you know, a lathe that I was able to purchase with um, before the bad times hit and um, some basic tooling. But the basic tooling that I have is exactly that. It's basic. You know, the chisels, a decent chisel for lathe work costs 50 or $60, and that's like for not great steel, not yeah. great wood, small little chisel. You know, they get really expensive really quickly. But what is a chisel? A chisel is a knife, right? Yeah, it's a weird shape. So knife. let's be... It's a weird-shaped knife. So it's really easy to go find out about the geometry of a chisel for a given purpose. So, for instance, the, the two that I made last week were uh, a couple of skew chisels. And after... I have one skew chisel. It's a little tiny skew, and it's very, very... Picky because of its um, being relatively thin, the sort of area that is safe to use on it without it just digging into the wood and causing you to have like a horrific experience and take a chunk of wood out of your project mm -hmm. is very, very small. Oh. Um, and so I wanted a bigger one and I wanted one that had a, a radius grind on it because I had seen them in use on YouTube and they looked super cool. Um, <laughs> so this is a great opportunity to. Um, basically stop what I was doing that was frustrating me a little bit at the time. And as you've said before, do something that I could be successful at. Yeah. So we'll um, I took a, took a piece of uh, 1074 steel that I have from the days past when I was making knives. 1074 steel is a medium, high, kind of high-ish carb, medium carbon steel that is uh, like something you might make a sword out of. It's mm -hmm. uh, when you harden it, it is still ductile enough that it can take an impact. Um, but it has more than enough carbon in it to get a nice sharp edge and to stay sharp for a decent amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's not a particularly modern type of steel for these types of things. It's not tool steel or anything, but it gets the job done. Used a hacksaw to cut that into its basic profile um, and to cut the angle on it. I used a file to uh, carve the bevels, which were very, very easy to lay out. I used a calipers and a... Um, to describe some center lines and to do a couple of offset measurements based on a chisel I had and the stuff I had read. Set up the angles, pop lines, grind to them. Not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. uh, carved a tang onto them, like a, a um, Harbor Freight weed burner and a propane torch, uh, which <laughs> is basically a uh, terrifying to use oversized propane torch to heat them up to oh, yeah. cherry red and quench them in a small can of um, automatic transmission. Let them uh, temper them uh, basically to a very light straw, which is to say just to the point where um, the stresses had been relieved out of the metal, but not enough to really anneal it which is, or soften the, uh, the hardening process really hardly at all. Mm -hmm. Let them cool. Quick polish, turned a couple of handles, burned them in. Now I've got chisels. You know, it's like yeah. it took me 
uh, probably in terms of actual labor, maybe eight hours, um, yeah. including just being really picky and like polishing the handles three times because I didn't get it right the first two. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, what do I have? I've got chisels that if I went to go buy them would have cost me 150 to 200 dollars a piece, and that are in and of themselves almost unobtainium. They're made yeah. in a style that is much more um, akin to how a traditional wood turner's chisel would have been made well before all of the sort of fancy post-World War II modern stuff has come into play, which I personally like. Um, mm -hmm. They're very easy to keep sharp, they hold an edge well, they're delight to use, and I've now got a better understanding of the tool itself having gone through this ritual of basically having to know everything about its design in order to be able to replicate it. And I have these tools that I've invested this time and energy in, and that when I use them, I have these fond memories of. Yeah. So it's just like all around a better experience than having spent money I don't have on chisels that I couldn't afford. Because yeah. now I get to have them, and I've got these nice memories with well, them. There's also, there's also an important thing that, that, that you really quickly touched on and, and came off of, of the fact that a lot of these tools you just can't get. Um Oh yeah, there are truly tools that are either not made at all, or are made in such small quantities by such esoteric folks that they're not reasonable to acquire. Yeah, like go try to buy an ads if you want to make uh, if you want to carve <laughs> out the uh, the butt wells in in a chair. Go to Home Depot and ask them for an ads and see how well that shit works. <laughs> it's just yeah. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, and th and that's a really interesting thing is that then you can look at that eight hours and say, well, that was eight hours that you didn't spend doing wood turning, which is the craft that you wanted to practice. Oh, but, that, but two that, of them probably were spent doing wood turning because I made the handles on the lathe. Yeah, and um, and even if you hadn't, even if the tool was entirely made by a different process, um, even if you consider that that you paid yourself for that tool, you came out way way ahead and have all these. Um, mental. There's all these mental advantages of now when you pick up that tool, you start off in a positive place. Absolutely. Yeah. It, there. There's a huge, huge advantage of that, and yeah, I do the same thing and make a lot of my own tools and jigs and things like that. And um, I, of course, relegate a lot more of my processes to robots making my stuff, but uh, I still understand the advantage. And honestly, there's, I, I think that the, the difference in that is almost just like a difference of media. Yeah. Um, as I'm, I'm less digitally inclined than you are in a lot of ways, but, and that's not a criticism by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. It's just different ways of working on things. But um, at the same time, you know, if I was making multiples, like, you know, the, uh, the kinds of stuff that you print out for, like, the, uh, the tabletop games and stuff like that, I mean, to do it. I mean, otherwise you're going to be doing mold making processes and you're basically just going to be using traditional methods to be doing roughly the same thing. So yep. it's kind of, you know, it's, it's just it's a different medium. Yep. Just different tool set. Um, so there's also the thing of, of, and one thing that that's important to note is that this isn't just a question of money and um, availability in that sense. Uh, but there's also that thing of where you're working on something late on a Saturday night and you just can't go get something yeah. or you don't want to wait until it, until it comes in the mail and, and the ability to kind of have this uh, holistic knowledge of all the things that are going into the project you're working on uh, gives you a lot more options in that situation than you would otherwise have. Absolutely. And like I said, reading um, these Basically, a book. I, I would highly recommend anyone who can find it reading books on any trade that you have any remote interest in from the pre-industrial revolution era because people just made do, man. I mean, when you read about a hacksaw being a modern tool and how it will let you cut through inch-thick steel with relative ease, and they're saying that because they're doing it with a saw instead of a cold chisel, <laughs> it's like... Okay. Yeah, yeah. I spent 10 minutes with a hacksaw cutting the steel that I needed to cut for my chisel, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that bad, but I was kind of whiny about it, to be all honest with you. There's things about it that are just not my favorite thing in the world. But yep. So yeah, if I could afford you know, a four or $500 small bandsaw designed for cutting metal, would it have taken me like 30 seconds instead of 10 minutes? Yeah, but like once again, back to what I have and what I don't have, what I can go get, what I can make, etc. It's... um. You know, a lot of the stuff that we complain about or that we feel like we need, we really can make do on or we can innovate around or we can 
work with in ways that are just um, not immediately apparent to uh, the mentality of I can go on Amazon and I can get it, or I can go down to the store and I can get it, or even that the things that you can go get from those platforms are, are necessarily good enough for what it is you're trying to do. Because, you know, having the right tool is really important, but having a good tool is also really important. You might have the right mm -hmm. tool, and it could be a very bad version of it, and it will be very it's kind of like an unsharp chisel you know the chisels that yeah. i made work really well as long as i keep them sharp but the minute I, I let them dull or i drop them on the ground or respect they will start to betray me and you know you go to home depot you can't even buy a hammer that doesn't need to have its face crowned you know unless yeah. you want to leave the weird little spiral turning marks on everything it behooves you to take 10 minutes with a fine file to carve that to very re gently remove that and to take the edges off so that you have a hammer that won't just use it on then all of a sudden you realize a hammer is a way more sophisticated tool than just a hammer appears to be oh yeah yep oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's one thing. Uh, I have. Yeah, a, that's one thing. I prefer knives that are like that, where you, where you you have to sharpen them pretty regularly, but they are easy to sharpen. I do oh yeah, I, I mean, perfect example. Of this my um my my knife mentor Bill I was telling you about one time made a uh, a knife out of a piece of steel that's called D two, and D two is like used in like. Uh, it's like the kind of steel that would be on the cutting edge of your paper cutter. It's just really meant to take a lot of um, abuse in the form of uh, like friction wear, like grinding kind of abuses, yeah. right? And so one would think that this would make a really excellent knife, and it does not. Uh, and the reason for it is, is that even though it can make a very good shearing edge, it really does not sharpen well to a cutting edge. And the amount of effort that it takes to put a mediocre edge on it in terms of sharpening is unbelievable because it is so resistant to abrasion. Yeah. Yeah, the thing that makes it good at cutting something yeah. abrasive like paper makes it also really hard to soften. Or, or really, really hard, hard to sharpen. Oh, yeah. To and sharpen. I'm sorry. People go through all these permutations. On the internet, you'll see a lot of stuff, people talking about Damascus steel and how great it is and like all these amazing properties of it. 1095 basic steel, like just the old school, it's got, you know, just under a percentage of carbon in it, will still make probably the best knife that you can buy. I mean, that forged, nice yeah. forged edge on it, sharpened well, and oh god, it'll rust if you don't put oil on it. Oh. Or, I don't know, care for your object every once in a while. It's, um, but it'll sharpen up. I mean, you can sharpen it on like a, a decently flat piece of granite that you found in the yard if you needed to in a survival circumstance. <laughs> and um, it will take an edge beautifully and it will hold it for a good long. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Okay, so this, that, that um, this covers something that we were talking about. Um, how do you feel about experiment versus honing? Because I know that when I'm working on craft stuff, I absolutely adore doing the first like few days of the learning process. And then as soon as I'm like 90% of the way good at something, I'm kind of done with it. Like I definitely have a problem with that. Um, how, how, how do you feel about that? And how do you see that? Cause you've just done so many things. How, how does that, do you need that last, five or two percent no um i suffer from the same disease that you do in a very big way um <laughs> so curiosity is the thing that propels pretty much any form of learning in my life yeah. and um i am i guess in some ways blessed with having a sort of obsessive mind and so when something catches my interest it is not too hard for me to spend a lot of time with it and so what happens for me is sort of um approximate understandings in a couple of different layers so uh like you said the first couple of days are always like oh i could do this for the rest of my life i love this this is great um and then that fades pretty quickly uh but usually the interest remains and there have only you know there have been a few things in my life that have been worth lifelong study food is absolutely one of them working with wood has been one of them um, metal to a certain extent has been one of them. Ceramics is something that I've always had an interest in, but very much in. So there's sort of like themes that kind of reemerge from all of these things. Mm -hmm. But, um, the 
really like I mean even for their for the last few years when I was running the restaurant, a lot of these sort of deep dives that I took were almost meditative. They were sort of things that were meant to help me disconnect from what my day-to-day -day reality actually was. Mm -hmm. And I happen to really enjoy learning, and so that sort of, for me, is, is a good outlet. But, um, you know, you, you find something that catches your interest. It peaks peaks you for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, you start to read a little bit about it. Usually after a little bit of that, you want to do it, right? You want to give it a shot. Um, I say to my wife a lot that um, any hobby worth pursuing usually costs at least $200 to get into. Yeah. And I don't mean that as like a barrier to entry or, or something like that. There's plenty of things that you can do that are relatively cheap to get into, but the reality a couple of tools and to get materials, you're in 200 bucks pretty much all the <laughs> pretty time. Pretty quickly, yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly and that's like real basic tools and real sparse material and everybody and who so... works on cars is just freaking out 200 bucks <laughs> oh yeah i know like that's nothing that's like not even a tool <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, oh yeah and, and i want to and i want to so... note something that that i've seen from that process that i think that you have as well because we get into these conversations kind of on the regular um of that when you do this when you do these deep dives and you just kind of obsess about something for a day or two or a few days or a week or a few months you don't lose that knowledge afterwards like it might become oh, no. hazy or it might become gray but you remember where to look for it and so in the future Not only... when you need that it's it's still there somewhere and i think that that's a really interesting thing and i think that confuses a lot of people is that you can just like pull back into this well of knowledge and say i think it's like this but i know where to check oh yeah i know where to check or also like i have um like with baking when i had been a long time since i've done something occasionally i'll just arrogantly be like i know what i'm doing you go through it and it doesn't really work but you look at it and you go i know why yeah, I you know, know I remember I this problem. Yeah. I've been down this road before. And like you said, I know where to go. I know my source materials and where to go find an answer if it didn't just jog my memory with that crude experience. Unto... The mm -hmm. other thing is that no, no learning goes unused. I mean, like I said, there's these general themes in, um, in most of the things that I, I learn how to do. And they all sort of interrelate in different ways. And... Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to decide. I have a slightly non-PC example, which is basically, you can edit this out if you don't like it. Yeah, but, go for it. Um, it one out. of the things that I that I did with, um, while I was working at the, while I was running the restaurant, was I um, learned about and built a 45 caliber 1911 hand. Um, that was very different from anything else I had done. Prior. Um, had never done a thing, had never really conceived of building a firearm but i learned about the history of it in one of my just sort of shallow dives so to speak and the mechanics of the device were really interesting to me mm -hmm. and it was sufficiently so to distract me from what i needed distracting from mm -hmm. the reality for that i mean let's talk about relative costs um i ended up buying for this process for this and this was over the course of about 18 months that this all took place i ended up spending about $750 in specialized tools, uh, yep. mostly jigs and various little fitting things that help you make sure that things go as right as And about another um, $1,800 on parts. Um, because if you're going to do this, you should build quality parts. And the, the issue yeah. with these is that there used to be this whole idea that you, you could go get a, um, a 1911 that was a GI from the 40s, and you could just like basically rebuild it and accuratize it. And that's just not the world we live in anymore. They're few and far between. They're expensive. And if you go buy the, like, the Philippine ones that work just fine, um, and you can do that to them, but you're going to end up spending comparable amounts of money. So I end up spending just in for, terms of parts just let me probably stop you real quick in a... before we continue this. Um, just for everybody listening, the 1911 is a semi-automatic pistol uh, popularized during World War II, and it's kind of been um, I don't know if popular is the right thing, but it's been a symbol ever since. Um, but yeah, keep going. Sorry, man. Yeah, no worries at all. So um, basically, I uh, end up spending considerable amount more money to make one of these than you ever would sort of is the point like the amount of resources that went into this i could have just gone out and bought a very high-end 1911 if that had been the interest but the the point of the money and the point 
point of the process wasn't so much to yield a handgun as it was to test the theory and understanding of the mechanics and to do a thing that I felt really confident that I could do after having read through. I mean, really, I have a, a book that's considered to be the Bible on this thing. It's a uh, wonderful collection of blacks of uh, gunsmithing notes uh, that were put together in the uh, the 70s by a very competent gunsmith. Um, and that basically explains more or less how everything goes together and what the tolerances are. And the fun thing about this is that there is not a piece on that firearm that does not require hand. everything has to be fit. Oh, and that weird. was why, you know, that that's the interesting part. This is um, one of the last firearms that still exists in terms of like common parlance that was made before mechanical, I'm sorry, before repeatable parts was like a thing in industry. Yeah. So this was at a time where mass produced parts would all still have to be hand fit and you can't necess necessarily take the parts from a 1911 handgun put it into another one and just have it function they'll require fitting yeah uh well while um, we're on that topic i think it's important to note that things that we take for granted as being interchangeable really are not um for oh, example yeah. actually in the same time period there was an engine made by the british called the merlin and it's a fantastic engine, made loads of power. It was absolutely wonderful. Um, I think it was made by Rolls Royce at the time. And the U.S. didn't have an engine that was equivalent. This was right before World War II, or right during World War II. And we got the plans for this. We, as the United States, got the plans from the British and started building them, and realized that we couldn't build them because the Merlin was hand fit. Every single component yeah. was made by one guy who built one engine from start yeah. to finish. And so all of the U.S. built versions of that engine are actually completely different because they had to be modified to work on, a, on an assembly line with a, 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 actually identical parts. And even nowadays, you can, yeah. you can have an engine hand fit again. You can have an engine taken apart and hand fit. It's like a Bugatti. Uh, Bugatti. Yeah, um, yeah. There, there's a few that do it. A lot of racing companies do it. Pretty much um, anybody who like does the backyard drag racing, all those uh, rednecks we see go out and, and um, race their cars. Uh, those are oftentimes very, very complicated engines that are very, very tightly fit. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That makes me very happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that actually brings me to to another uh, a topic that I think is important, and that's one of precision. Um, there are some people who we have mutual friends who uh, do not believe in precision. I am one of those people who does not believe terribly in precision. Um, and we have friends who, who believe too much in precision. Um, we definitely know the, those people. Um, oh yes. So, what are your feelings about precision? Like, if I say that everything I do in my life has to be done to a, a 64th of an inch, that's not reasonable. Um, so, so how no, do you not. how do you say this is how much precision is required? Especially, I mean, and this goes for everything from from working on that on that firearm yeah. you're talking about to uh, measurements and baking uh, to all sorts of things. How do you to temperatures and metal working? Um, can okay. you give us a few Let's examples start with of the fire firearm? Yeah. This... Sure. Yeah, the fire a really great example of this, actually. You can make, like, you can hand fit a 1911 to within, like, a hundred thousand, I'm sorry, a hundred thousand a little extreme, a thousandth of an inch, let's say. That's very doable. Um, you start spending a lot of time with calipers and polishing stones and sandpaper, you'll realize a thousandth of an inch is actually pretty hard to move with fine, fine materials. So one can absolutely get that kind of tolerances if you do that you will have a firearm that will function like for two shots before it has eaten up all of the tolerances and jammed itself oh. so that wouldn't really be a particularly good thing to do on the other end of the spectrum if your tolerances are too weak you start to lose the mechanical repeatability of the system and what that really means is that the barrel isn't always locking up to the same spot so even though your sights aren't moving everything into the position as to where so the much. bullet's going is going to yeah. be different and so in a handgun it really doesn't matter that much and that's why like a lot of the the ones that um were actually issued had pretty 
sloppy tolerances in a lot of cases. It's because they work well enough to get a bullet in the body, you know, 25 yards or whatever. Um, but if you're looking for like, you know, the the gold cup ones that were you know, using for uh, shooting pr uh, competitions and stuff like that had much finer fit and finish, but still a fit and finish that allowed for enough tolerance for the thing to function. Yeah. So, um, like you're saying, there are a lot of things that need to be taken into account, and I think that when it comes to precision, it is a question of how much precision is required for the task at hand. Um, there, I would say that being overly precise when it doesn't matter isn't being precise at all. Interesting. So, can, can you explain that? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, I will try to, and I'm going to do it by radically changing what I'm talking about. Um, one of the best le <laughs> one of the best lectures that I received while at culinary school was from a guy whose name was Chef Dubinard, Alan Dubinard, and we came in one um, afternoon to his bake shop, and he had written on a uh, do you remember not whiteboards but those like really big uh, pads of paper? Yeah that stand up on an easel. Yeah, he had one of those and he had written on it, is it quality relative with a question mark and, and asked us that question phrased exactly that way with a very blank face and demanded. None of us had a clue what the hell he was talking about because he spoke um, Spanish and French well before he spoke English. Oh. Um, so it was kind of like, what is, what are we getting at here? And he proceeded to kind of explain, Explained to us, this was a class that we had right before we went out on an internship, and it was an idea of um, integrity in craft within the scale of quality. And so he was essentially trying to let us know that some of us were going to be going to areas where, unlike the products that we were producing and making and working with at school, we were maybe going to be working with like ready-made materials. We might be working with um, box mixes, mm -hmm. with inferior quality chocolate, uh, things like that. <laughs> and that can be extremely disheartening to somebody who has just spent an extremely large amount of money, relatively speaking, as well as a fair amount of time investing and in learning how to utilize these very fine materials to a very fine end. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that a lot of us are about to get a really crude wake awakening as to what the reality of the industry actually is. And one of that, that um, you're going to be making mediocre food. That's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. A lot of people are going to go out in the world after having had this great training, and they're going to be employed to make mediocre food. What do yeah. you do with that? You know, um, and the question sort of becomes, as he said, is it quality that is relative? Is it? okay to make mediocre food mediocrely you know or should bear their skills to do the best job they can with the materials available mm -hmm. um and this to me is very similar to the idea of of precision because it's like just because it doesn't need to be precise doesn't mean that i can just do this haphazardly and necessarily get a nice result i am if i spend all day working with and you know it's like um, icing a cake if i have to work with sweet grease which is to basically say the stuff you get at like the market which is to like powdered sugar and like fat of some variety yeah. most of the time not a very good one it has characteristics that mean that it's not going to behave like proper buttercream will it's not going to get as smooth it's not going to be as airy it's not going to have the same kind of finish effects mm -hmm. and if i on american buttercream what i expect from Italian buttercream, I'm going to work, and I can waste a lot of time doing that and not necessarily still get a good result. Yeah. So you have to know when and where to apply effort, but you also have to have integrity in sort of your, your practice to know that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right to the extent yes. that it can be for that you know individual project or individual material or whatever it is. Yeah, I think that there's... Um... Yeah, there's an important thing that I, I should actually make just a sign for the door of my all that for the door of my office um, that just says if you don't have the time and effort to do it to do it right, when are you gonna have the time and effort to do it twice? Uh, another one of my pastry chefs used to say, "Make it nice or make it twice." <laughs> yeah, that same. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's definitely a problem. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that, that I, I agree that the concept of precision really is applicable. Um, 
and it's actually funny and i was talking to a um, general contractor about this a few maybe a month or two ago um how anything less than about a quarter to an eighth of an inch i switched to the metric system um, oh yeah yeah which is was really just mind-boggling to him but um yeah anything that's small i generally do in metric uh, and then anything that's big or anything related to construction materials I do in, in the traditional English system of, of inches and feet. Um, and switching between them is actually it's not problematic anymore, but it definitely was for a while. It takes getting used to, yeah. yeah. Um, I can offer for your, um, for your people one other sort of interesting thing about that on that yeah, topic. Awesome. And this, is, this works really well for me, and it works... Um, in part because of the amount of time that I've spent working with volume and uh, weight conversions, because that's a huge part of being a pastry chef, especially one that's trained in a European tradition, is converting ratios, converting baker's math, converting yeah. between different units and stuff like that. And um, when I transitioned from doing that primarily to doing a lot of construction stuff and I was doing welding, I happened upon this interesting observation, which is that sub-inch measurements are... Basically, uh, I'm hopefully not going to use the wrong mathematical term here, but they're like base 16. If you think about things in terms of 16ths of an inch, it works really well. And it happens to be that a pound is also 16 ounces. So when you're dealing with, um, you can basically memorize a sort of mathematical permutation and then be able to very easily, regardless of which of the imperial units you're using, be able to talk about them in fractional senses very, very easily. Oh, that's a good idea. There's so... also... Basic relations like three eighths is half of three quarters. Three quarters, and when you kind of just understand that, and you understand that three eighths is an eighth more than a quarter, which is two. Eighths, there's a little bit of stuff in there, and the the thing that's nice about it is that the decimals make just as much sense. So yeah. you can kind of spend just a little bit of time, like you did, um, learning how to kind of bounce back and forth between the metric and the um, imperial system. And that's one way to do it. But if you're, you know, just kind of dyed in the wool, you're already used to feet, and that's just not going to change. Spend some time with um, just memorizing the 16 or even eight of the 16, because you can just always divide the eight by two. And if you're decent at mental math, yeah, suddenly it becomes really, really easy to deal with complicated measurements with the inch system. Yeah, I like the idea of 16. It's just quicker in some ways. Yeah, and like I said, you can just use basic division like by two and permutations there and of to get to whatever level of you know complexity you're looking for. But when you're looking at the tape and the tick marks don't really make any sense, sometimes it's easier to just be like, okay, Count I want five sixteenths, yep. and that means I'm just going to go to three eighths and I'm going to go slightly for you know, or I'm going to go yep. slightly under it. Just stuff like that where it's like good enough for government work. Talking about precision once again, tape yep. measure you're not going to get much better than a, like a thirty seconds of an inch anyways. So just like do the basic math, get in that ballpark, be good with it, and be consistent in the way you do that, and it'll work out. Consistency, as we oftentimes say, is oftentimes can be more important than accuracy. Yes. Yeah. A bunch of parts. You know, if you're going to be wrong, at least be exactly. If your parts off, let all of them be off, and let them be off the same way. Yeah, matter. the same way. That's important. Yeah, as long as everything's off. The same way. Yeah, make the same mistake four times, and your table will be fine. <laughs> That's correct. If you cut all the table legs the table. a quarter under, you're going to be okay. If they're all just a quarter, yeah. the off minute you start getting things day. off, yeah, then it's not okay. Oh man. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we're we're uh, working on old houses. You can find that of where somebody was a quarter off in the same direction every time, or the person who just didn't care within a quarter. It makes a oh, huge difference. Yeah, yeah, it makes a really really big difference. Um, yeah, especially on something the size of a house, you have your your errors can stack and turn into monstrosities. Yes, and that's a that's an important thing when we're talking about uh, precision is er, is um, errors stacking. I think that's a really important thing that a lot of people don't consider is that if I cut a bunch of pieces that are all a foot and I lay them end to end, I have ten feet. Uh, if I cut all mm -hmm. of those off and all under. Well, then I'm at, you know, nine feet, uh, ten and a half inches or something like that, and I have a very big problem. Um, right. Yeah. 
And it also, just like thinking about like working with stick material. Materials, the fact that um, a 10 foot stick of lumber or metal does not yield 10 one foot pieces because no, of kerf and various other realities. Yes, and kerf you know? is the um, amount of wood taken away by the saw, essentially what's turned into sawdust. Yes, yeah, wood, metal, whatever it is. And it happens even if you're using something like a cold chisel because of deformity. You know, it's yeah. just like there's no escaping the fact that the act of cutting something extracts a cost. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it. I like that. Um, what was I going to say? I got lost. Hang on. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, one thing that I think that you get into a lot is types of making that have low barriers of entry. Uh, like, I, I can understand a knife that works well, but you also make things that pretty much no matter how much I know about that thing, I'm going to be maybe not impressed, but at least appreciative. If that makes sense, and and I just want to, and I'm just kind of wondering, does, does that just go with the deep dives? Is that just a natural out, outpouring of the deep dive? A couple of things that I would say on that. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about when we were talking about knives, about making making objects and making a lot of them, and sort of through that being able to. I don't know. It's not any different than drawing. It's not any different than pottery. You know, you're, it takes time to be able to, and practice to be able to make something that is a true expression of is. Mm -hmm. And a knife, once again, being a really good example is that, you know, if you ask an average person, like, let's say I gave you that bar of steel in a file and I said, make me a knife, Wyndham. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let's say it already had like a handle profiled on it. And basically what you just needed to do is shape the way in which the, um, what we would call the belly, but if you think about how the uh, the knife goes from being flat to rounding up towards the tip, which obviously yeah. can take a number of different... So you're going to make that choice, and you're going to... Uh, and anything else you want to do, as so far as the blade is concerned, and put an edge on it. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people will do is carve it basically only in uh, two places. They'll profile the blade, so to speak. They'll make it look like a chef knife or like a buoy knife or whatever it is that they like. Yeah. And then they'll probably put an edge on it. And if you do that and you look at it, it's not going to look right. And the reason is because it's missing some fundamental aspects of what a knife is. Um, for instance, the most distinct one being what's called distal taper. Okay, and uh, distal one. taper, to be, yeah, and let me, <laughs> yeah. I beat you to the punch here. Distal taper is um, the, it's kind of like what your fingers do. Uh, my, I'm looking at my hands, my fingers don't do a lot of distal taper, but a lot of people's fingers have a nice distal taper to it. And so if you think about where you would hold on to the knife, which is um, the bolster commonly, uh, right where the handle is sort of is meeting the blade, sometimes there's a bolster there, sometimes not, that should be the thickest point on at it from the top down. Yeah. And if you look at it, you can kind of imagine a diamond shape. Uh, it tapers a little bit towards the, the pommel end where the handle is, and it tapers a lot towards the tip of the knife. Yeah, I guess it does. And what does that do? Well, it reduces resistance to the knife going into things. It increases the keenness of the edge. It also creates... You know, if, now if you look down at the, uh, if you look at the way that the blade also exhibits distal taper from the spine, the part we were just looking at, to the actual edge of the knife where the cutting is, and what is what we have there is this nice taper, and what that taper is doing is supporting the edge. You're basically making this nice smooth transition from the thickest part of the knife, the spine, where it's the all supporting an increasingly fine edge until you get to where it really should be a wire edge of sharpness that's been stropped off, and you have, you know, a knife that is um, as keen as it could possibly be, given the limitations of the material. But without those two additional taperings, you basically have a sharpened piece of steel. You yeah. don't really have a knife. Well, and I imagine it would look a lot more like a so, cleaver or something like that. But even a cleaver's got those tapers to them, and the difference Probably. between like a Chinese cleaver that's meant to be used more like a uh, chef knife and a more traditional chopper, uh, like you would use for making pork chops in the butchery process, is um, the thickness of the spine, the amount of taper. But both of them are going to have it because once again, you think about that chopper. 
what does the what does the taper do? The taper allows on both both instances, you know, for a chopper, we're not so concerned about the point having a lot of distal taper, but we still want the chopping edge to. It needs to be robust enough that it can deal with cutting through the little bit of bone that it needs to, yeah, but it also true. needs to have taper so that it has a cleaving action because it has to push the meat away as yeah. it's cutting through it. You know, it has to be able to push the bone away. You, um, talking about kerf once again, yeah. the reason why, um, you know, a fighting knife like a, a, a Bowie or like the katana, a samurai sword, yeah. are shaped the way they are. They have pretty aggressive tapers, too. And the idea on them is, is that actually on like, for instance, a, this is a little bit of a digression, but on um, some forms of katana, the way in which they're shaped, the widest point of the blade is actually about midway down or maybe a third of the way down from the spine and the spine is ground with a little bit of relief and the point on that is actually to reduce the resistance of the blade once it's actually made the cut as it passes through the tatari mat or the bamboo or the whatever yeah. that's being cut and so the geometry of a blade has a lot to do with its character because it has a lot to do with its intended use and its functionality there um and that's sort of what it is you're talking about in terms of the object is that it represents an understanding to a certain extent about why and like in my case a very amateur one even still like i can rattle all that stuff off but i'm not a master knife maker by any stretch of the imagination i'm barely a journeyman at these things but i know enough to be able to make an expression of it and so the object that i'm creating has a fair chance of at least being you know um true to itself, true to its context, and therefore has an opportunity to catch your imagination, to um, for you to note that it is remarkably different than a commercially available version of something similar. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more than just the fact that it was made by somebody who, you know, you have some affection for or whatever, but also that it in and of itself is interesting because it displays all of these things that are not necessarily in your awareness, but that are perceivable. Yeah, I think that's an important thing about that is the the things that are perceivable but not in your awareness i think that there's a, there's a lot to be said for that um and i think that it happens kind of across the across the realm of things that we call crafts um and it's oh, less yeah. intellectualized um like you can enjoy you can enjoy good food if you don't know about food. You can enjoy it more if you know yes. about it. But well, the, the sort of concepts of beauty that those things evoke sit naturally, sort of on the landscape in front of you, um, irrespective of like the fact that there are some like fine foods in air quotes or whatever that require um, some development of palate to appreciate or other sort of pretentious things that one can say. Well, you can art would be serve the same. exactly, you know. But at the same time, I can serve food to a you know an eight-year-old and they will tell me they will be right you know it's yeah. like it may or, you know if it has to do with it being more sophisticated than their taste then i failed to cater to my audience you know there's other ways of putting it it's um yeah well that goes back to some of the more complicated things as well like you were talking about knives that require specialized care and things like that that you have to build that to an audience i mean you do and you don't. I think one of the interesting things about craft is that there exists a collective memory of their relevance. You know, there is a, um, why do people carry knives in their pockets in yeah. the modern context is something I think about with some frequency. To open um, Amazon boxes. Are, nope. You know, not exactly. It's just like they still serve a function, but like even you could use your keys to do that. We've all watched people do these like ridiculous mechanisms to open boxes because they don't have a knife. But yeah. there is a huge importance on a lot of people, myself included. I just want to have the knife. And uh, I mean, I do martial arts. I do things where I might conceivably be able to use it in like, some sort of self-defense context. But it's not really why I'm carrying it. There's like a symbolism or a just an attachment to the object. And we've had knives for as long as we've had technology. You know, it's one of the most basic sort of things. It's an inclined plane that we carry around with us. Uh, <laughs> And it just doesn't go away. There's sort of a cultural thing about it that still has some importance. The same with, like, pottery. You know, the, people still make ceramic pots, but we've got plastic. You know, it's like we've got faster ways of doing it. We've got... Yeah, we would consider from a sort of modernist way better, you know, or whatever. Yeah. But we still like 
ceramics. We still also really like ceramics that are made by people's hands as opposed to just like slip cast and, you know, glazed in mass manufacturing. The thing I think that's so interesting about craft is, is that, like you said, it isn't, it doesn't require any real knowledge base. Knowledge base helps, uh, certainly, like we uh, believe you said with Margaret Lynn, the idea that um, if you want to appreciate something more, learn about it, sure. But at the same time, it's really pretty easy to just approach a well-made object, especially one that you can uh, pick up and look at and touch and just appreciate it and be impressed by it and look at it and think, well, maybe I could make something like this, but it looks like it might actually be take some effort to do that. It's um, It kind of just gets at a basic human experience that uh kind of taken away from us yeah i think that the uh the creation of utilitarian objects is also um kind of interesting there that they they that they do have context they they have they have an initial um uh what would you call it like they that the first step towards your your experience of them is already taken care of because they do something for you like, right, their function. You don't have well, to even walk things that are homages to walk towards you. Well, when they're well executed, they do. Because I mean, think about it. If you're in um, a ceramics studio or a shop, and you're interested in buying something, there's going to be something that speaks to you, probably. You know, yeah. if you're going to buy something, if if the wares are things that you like in the first place. But it's not going to be everything, you know. There are things about well-made craft objects or craft objects that, like good art, are able to evoke something larger than themselves or sort of hint at some sort of universal experience in kind of like the Carl Jung sort of sense of the way. And it's, um, you know, there's they're engaging in a way that is hard to put into words it's more of a visceral experience there's an attraction to it because it sort of sits there as a good example of itself um amidst a sea of mediocrity yes yeah that's that's always a special place Um, well it's it's where we reside you know that's the thing and you said about like accessibility earlier with crafts and stuff like and it's like the um the low barrier to entry, the relatively crude tools with which they were traditionally made, um, you know, Raku uh, clay being a fine example of you can bake it in a, in a bonfire. Um, there's lots of different ways by which one can just, you know, two or three hundred dollars worth of stuff together and start experimenting and over time have a relatively low barrier to entry to having the possibility of creating beautiful objects that yes. doesn't necessarily have you know the same it's not capital a art it's that's fine you know maybe you can there are some people who can push these things really far and can get into that realm but they're few and far between but in the meantime you you can either as a hobby or as a vocation or as a meditation or whatever it may be for you you can just create objects and try to make beautiful things Mm -hmm. and uh, have some success at that kind of regardless of who you are if you just make things yeah um there's a big topic I want to cut, get, get to at the end, but, but while we're on this, uh, and this is specific kind of to you, and I'm interested in, in your opinion on this, um, is the fact that you've spent a huge amount of your life making these artifacts, making tools, making objects that are, if not permanent, they are long-lasting. Uh, but you've also spent a lot of your life making these same high craft, very uh, technically quality objects that are consumable and almost by definition uh, impermanent uh, making food and things like that 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 are not meant to last that are not meant to exist more than a few hours if not seconds or minutes and uh, do you do you feel differently towards those objects uh, or or is it coming from the same place I've had a really big transformation in the way that I've thought about food from the time in which I started seriously considering it as a vocation, which would be around 15. And when I had to part ways with the restaurant I opened about uh, mid last year. Um, and in the time since then, for that matter, mm-hmm. food is a very complicated topic, um, as is food service in general. I went to culinary school to learn 
how to bake bread pretty specifically and learned a lot of other stuff along the way. But because of the fact that I was attracted to what at, was essentially the craft of, uh, of the whole. Um, and some of this is, is obviously with retrospect, but, um, yeah. you know, when I used to talk with my grandfather about why I wanted to go to culinary school and I wanted to be a baker, he understood very much that there was this kind of old school thing that I was interested in tapping into. There was the idea ending your time doing a craft, getting good at it as a sort of a course of just reality of just doing it and it being something that could pay the bills enough to keep you kind of rolling, you know, yeah. to have a decent life, but that yeah. the expectation was you're going to be working. I accepted that. Yeah. Um, I went to culinary school and I learned how, how to do food as and as art, because that's where the industry is and was, especially in the, you know, around 2005. Yeah. And, and, um, it was the best general education I could have hoped to have ever had. It was very well suited to somebody like myself who has a pretty good work ethic naturally, is very interested in learning, and um, who is a mirror, has a fairly high energy level, um, yeah. and is pretty interested in getting things done. So it was a good, it was a good place for me in a lot of ways. Um, Coming out of the industry into the recession of 2007 yeah. was very difficult. We worked in the industry, both my wife and I, who I met there, for some time. Um, but it really just didn't work. And that sort of led to the initial diversification of skills that we've been kind of discussing thus far this morning. Um, let's see, I'm losing my lead, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, it, it was just about the making of, of consumables versus the making of artifacts. Like, how, right, how do you right. feel about So, that? Um, we worked initially in fine dining sort of settings, um, and that was fun, but it's not really a good lifestyle, and it's, once again, it's trying to make food for art and to sell it in a very short window of time, in which it's good. Um, it was okay, because we were in a fine dining restaurant popular so you know that was we were able to do it but it wasn't like really paying the bills by which i mean we weren't moving out of my parents basement with that kind of <laughs> income and yeah. um both had to kind of look at diversifying our skill sets this is the same time i was going to the electronics and welding schools to keep the uh, insurance afloat cool yeah so 2007 rolling around recession hitting um you know we ended up going more in a sort of educational direction and i sort of had a a good long hiatus from the food service um for several years as I was working in uh, limited amounts of like welding and construction fabrication work and uh, working for the Master Craftsman Studios, which is a weird art house thing in Florida, uh, North Florida, that ultimately became part of FSU more properly and um, got some experience making furniture and doing a lot of molding and working with all different kinds of materials and dealing with eccentric design. <laughs> um, Basically, at that point, not really interacting with food very much, um, but sort of continuing, you know, just learning about it generally and always always cooking. But I, I honestly didn't bake for for quite some time. Um, when I ended up getting back into the industry more proper, I had um, reached at that point the conclusion that uh, the only way my life was going to get better was through entrepreneurship. Um, and with a great deal of effort, I managed to find and some business partners and we you know we gave it a go so to speak and in that the inherent of the economics of making food and selling it and we were not in a particularly good market we were trying to do something that was a little bit altruistic but even aside the point from that um you can make very good product and you can put it out into the world and without adequate flows of people and without adequate advertising without adequate like customer base basically yeah. at the end of the day it sort of doesn't matter and the same thing i think is true in art where if you just make art in a, in a vacuum um it you know maybe when you die someday somebody will find all your stuff and like maybe it'll be great <laughs> yeah. but um that doesn't work when you're when your product only lasts like uh, i mean some pastry there was stuff that i would make that have a shelf life of like seriously eight hours yeah you know i would work a very long time to make a to make beautiful croissants to make i i was doing vinoiserie for some time vinoiserie is um croissant danish puff pastry they're all what we call laminated doughs and yeah. they are a process that um 
is very tedious, but to which I'm well suited and where you essentially are managing the um, alternating layers of dough and butter by rolling it out and folding it, but the dough and the butter chill to different hardnesses at different rates and have to have the same plasticity throughout the entire process, oh, and God. the process takes like four hours um, yeah. in terms of like sheeting it and getting it to where it actually has enough layers, and um, so that's like puff pastry. Danish and croissant are that, but with yeast. So just mm -hmm. think about that. Oh, um, I love making them. I'm pretty good at it. Uh, but once again, people balk at, at 350 for one of those. And this is something that costs you like upwards of seven dollars in New York. And I'm making it at the same level of quality as somebody who up there is liable to be making it. At. And I'm sending them home with my employees at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, so it's like it becomes exceedingly frustrating because um, you can't really make money doing that. Yeah. And, and the ways by which you could make money doing that are, for me, run up very heavily against the integrity we were talking about yeah. earlier. So um, by the time I decided to part ways with it as a as a creative venture and had sort of buttoned it up in such a way that it wasn't going to be um, economically devastating for other people, um, yeah. basically had reached the conclusion that... Um, the only way that I can cook, there's a, there's a couple of conditions under which I can cook. <laughs> One is for myself and for my friends. Yes. And the other is as performance, essentially. Essentially as art. Because okay. it is not really, it's just, it's like, you know when you're using the wrong material? Yep. And so as a result, it fights you the whole way and the end result just isn't as good as it could have been, even if it's fine. Yep. I feel like that is what running a restaurant is like. And I, I'm here to ultimately say there's a number of reasons why I personally was not able to do that successfully, and many of them are my own shortcomings. That being said, my critiques of the industry are very just that, in my opinion, this is not an appropriate way to make food for consumption. You know, We were yeah. talking earlier about these sort of old school ideas of, of bread baking that I had when um, I initially went to culinary school, there are places still in this world, and granted they're in places like India and Pakistan, where there is a person in a community who is the baker. And their yes. job is not only to bake bread for the community, but also to literally bake the bread that other members of the community have made themselves and bring to the baker to do it. There's a sort of communal responsibility. And this is a thing that is this person's livelihood you know he's yeah. not living any better or any worse in many respects or she as it may be i don't mean to gender assign um than anyone else in this village and that is to say that within the context of their society he has a respectable existence yeah. i would love to be that person <laughs> i would love nothing more than yeah. to run a wood fire oven all bake bread and to make over time the most beautiful bread that you have ever conceived of because I had just gotten so good at it. Not because I was so worried about it, but because of the fluidity of motion with which I could shape it from having shaped not just at this point in my life as I have thousands of loaves, but tens of thousands of loaves. Yeah. Just the inherent skill and greatness that go with doing something you care about for a long period of time. But our society is not, not set up for that, that, and it no. is not going to be within my lifespan. So that's not how I'm going to live my life. Um, and that's sort of, you know, to an extent why I had to make the decision to, uh, to put my knife down, to put my rolling pin down, you know? So um, that's kind of the reality is that if I want to practice my craft, I can't practice my craft for economic reasons. And, and I had to come to accept that. And one thing that is interesting about this, and you can take this in whatever way you want to, I don't necessarily mean it metaphysic, but in the, last several months i have cooked probably the best food i've ever made in my life i've had some of the best bakes i've ever had in my life and by giving it up, my my own skills have opened up to me in a way that they were unavailable when i was doing the venture yeah no i, I think that that's completely no. fair and i think that a lot of people see that and um that's one of my that's one of the things I kind of always get on my students about is that the thing that you love may not make a great career. Even if you can make money at it, it also, you may not find it to your liking. Yeah, let me also just say in my personal experience, and as with everything, your mileage may 
vary, but yeah. I think if you are doing creative purposes for money, you are... I'm not going to say doing it wrong. That's a little bit judgmental. Yeah. Um, you're but I think that you are missing... Yeah, you're missing also out on sort of a an essential opportunity that exists there because you can absolutely like you could employ your graphic design skills for like I don't know an oil company or something and you could make a lot of money um but there's that's very different than engaging in graphic design in a way that's actually creative and meaningful for you and you're not going to really create I mean what are you going to do create like a beautiful infographic about how like they're destroying it it's yeah. it doesn't you know it doesn't suit there's there's like you said there's conflicts to these things um and if what you want to do is make things that are beautiful, and I believe this in my own personal philosophy, whether you're talking about art with a capital A or craft or whatever, however kind, whatever words and capitalizations you like, <laughs> that it comes down to the same thing, that you're going to have to spend a lot of time in probably a dimly lit room or a well-lit studio doing this thing. And if you don't like doing this thing, you are not going to obtain a certain level of greatness in it because... Talent and genius and all that stuff are really overrated, and even when people have them, they still have to employ a huge amount of effort to get anywhere meaningful, and the only people who you hear about that produce art that's going to matter in a couple hundred years, or even like the, the ten years that you and Margaret Lynn were talking about last, mm -hmm. are people who are creating art that exists in a context that is different than making money. If your yeah. goal is to make money, or if your goal is to put your art on a gallery wall then you're creating it for that reason that is the point of the art you are making and that is the context that it lives in and at a certain point it's not going to matter anymore because it's going to be crowded out of that marketplace by new stuff doing the same thing or at a certain point we won't care about it for economic reasons the same way well the context and so will if you engage with that context. yeah exactly the context will change and um trying to create things that speak to the human experience or that touch people or that move them or that imply some sort of um, emotive experience or memory or whatever is different. Yeah. And um, I personally am more motivated by that than I am communicating a political idea or a viewpoint or anything else. And that's one of the reasons why the craft stuff works for me. Yeah. Um, and, and while we're talking about uh, craft, and one thing I kind of want to, this is this is going to be a, ta a, a tangent for some stuff that we were talking about before, but I think it is important in that you've talked about people who you've learned from that just had institutional knowledge. Um, and guilds and apprenticeship is not really something that we do too much anymore. Uh, here and there it's done, and in certain industries it's done. Uh, you can go be an apprentice pipe fitter or electrician or all of those things, but, but generally it's kind of frowned upon. Um, and in the art world, I think it's called the atelier system. Um, but that's something that's kind of frowned upon, but I think that you and I both have been very uh, lucky to have come across people who had that knowledge and uh, could take advantage of those things. And I would just, if you wouldn't mind, I would just like to, to hear a little bit more about your, your opinions on that system and whether or not you think they have a place now. Sure. Um, so the idea of guilds really, like you said, we don't do that exactly any. Anymore. The closest thing we have is unions, but I'm going to come back to that in a minute because um, okay. that's a bit of a digression. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of things that can get confusing in that. The sort of idea of guilds very, very broadly, and once again, not an expert here. Um, people with real historical knowledge, I'm sure, would have substantive disagreements, but it's just from a very broad spectrum. A guild was essentially a way to keep highly specific usually complicated knowledge alive and to also further the development of crafts that were important um, to whatever the civilization they may have been operating in. And there's a number of different ways that this existed. You know, um, for Egypt had ways of doing it, Japan had ways of doing it, but the sort of overarching ideas that are the same. A lot of them would be um, basically membership oriented, a lot of concepts of like um, protection of secrets being uh, a part of what's going on with that. And in part of that being because 
a lot of that knowledge was developed over many people's lifetimes through trial, error, and careful observation. And so the things that were learned were a lot of like oral teaching as opposed to written uh, manuscript and were more about um, experience and observation than like what we would consider more scientific method at this point. Like, you know, they don't understand why things happen. They just know that they happen. And so that yeah. knowledge gets passed down a lot. And um, so, like I said, a lot of protection of the, the sort of pipeline of information um, would sort of be a part of them. Interesting fact features about them though would be um the idea that the the guild as a whole would be able to do jobs that individual craftsmen would not um the ability for people to work together towards uh, sort of larger goals within the ideas of what that craft was mm -hmm. um and being able to influence each other uh you know and this kind of goes to early concepts of what you might consider mass production to a certain extent also like mm -hmm. um you know your town needs bowls to eat out of it's a necessity um yeah. there are some materials that exist wherever you are right and there's a group of people who know how to make bowls and you are you're either able to through heredity or through some other method gain access to that and that is now what you do right um, within those kinds of guild systems, generally speaking, there is an idea of apprenticeship, which is to say that you're generally going to work with a person who's a member of that guild who has already achieved the level of master, right? Yep. And um, learn from them initially by doing scut work and essentially being weeded out if you're not willing or able to do hard work and eventually learning more and more techniques and once again a lot of this being in a sort of a, the idea of repetition and oral tradition and stuff like that and i'm sure the written traditions within them as well too i'm just once again mm -hmm. trying to talk from a very global sort of old standpoint on this stuff um with, after like usually depending upon the craft and the thing is somewhere in the area of like six to 12 years um you, you would be considered like a journeyman and would be able to practice under one of these people so you would still have responsibilities to the guild you would still have responsibilities to a master but you would be acknowledged as having like the basic skills level to necessary to be competent uh, to operate and so you would now be essentially instead of an apprentice you would be sort of more like an employee or a charge you know um and your situation in life would be better but it would still be subservient um, you would continue down that road for some time until you were able to produce something that would show that you had progressed from just a normal run of the mill, you know, person doing this trade to somebody who had the understanding of it that the guild would seem necessary to kind of designate you as being a master craftsman. And what that would really mean is, um, if you think about this in modern terms, they're saying you can go open up shop. Yeah. Um, okay. You've reached the standard. You can do this well enough to represent the guild. And would that right? be at the point? At so which how would you could, um, would that be at the? Sorry for stopping you. Uh, would that be at the point no, at no. which you could have your own apprentice? So it's also a teaching position to some extent. Yeah, I I don't know enough in, in specifics to say like what the progression would be, but essentially, okay. um, you would have produced an item that proved your ability to uphold the standards of the organization mm -hmm. and that gave you the right to be able to open up a studio so okay. and like this is i believe true in in renaissance times as well but once again i don't want to overstep any of my my knowledge of boundaries but in terms of like you know painters and stuff like that your ability to go set up a school or a studio or to be considered a peer essentially amongst the um the functioning artists of that time the way by which one would do this would be to produce a masterpiece yeah. And, you know, our idea of a masterpiece in the modern times is like um, the uh, the spirit struck you with genius or, you know, circumstances or chance came through and you made this thing that was like a once in a lifetime thing. And that might very well happen or whatever. But the idea of a masterpiece and like the idea of a guild is, is that it's the proof of competency. That masterpiece is the thing that says that uh, proves rather that you can do you can make an item that is at the level of quality necessary to be representative of this organization. And it is now the baseline of expectation of what you will produce moving forward. It becomes the initial measurement by which the things that you produce 
by yourself now you have the responsibility of making sure the things you're putting out for public consumption are at least as good as this mm -hmm. yeah that's really interesting. you know and it's and a it, very it makes sense the word makes sense it's the piece that makes you a master <laughs> Exactly. And it's so it's like it's not the culmination of your life. It's the beginning of it. Yeah. You know, it's like, OK. And so one has to think to themselves as they're making things, where does this piece stand in terms of what I've made thus far? If you have a shelf and you're making objects and I, I do this literally, as was suggested to me by one of my current mentors, where I put the things up. And right now I'm making relatively crude objects because I have not turned a lot of wooden objects before in my life, let alone. And so so they're not great, and as I make more, the ones that are least great get removed and are replaced with ones of increasingly good quality. At some point, there will be something up there that will make my mentor, that will be not a masterpiece, but it will be, become the standard by which everything else is judged. I will try to make things yes. only that good. At some point, it will become the thing that is knocked off the shelf. You know, at some point, the masterpiece gets knocked off. It's not... The culmination of your life it is a step along the way it is a standard yeah uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting concept and i think that that's something that um only if we are so lucky to be able to make things so continuously and to such quality that we can continue to improve like that absolutely yeah. absolutely um okay but and then... hence the importance of continuing to make yes 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 uh, the last thing I'd like to cover, and I think a big thing that, that we've we've hit it out continuously throughout this conversation, is um, is just the mental health benefits of just making stuff. Uh, and and, and you, you, I think you've described it as making as meditation. And this is something that I've found. Um, starting in the fall, I kind of got back in a big way. Starting in early, late, late summer, early fall, I, I kind of got back in a big way into making objects for games. Uh, I think you, you you referenced it earlier. Yeah. Um, making objects for games, which is a compilation of design skills, symbols, uh, a lot of just uh, scale modeling and things like that. Um, but I've just made a lot of stuff. And before that, I was working on house. I was working on the house and doing stuff like that. But this is like making individual objects that are finished and they're done, and I just can put them on the shelf, just like you were talking about. And I'm just in a much better place than I was before. I was doing that sort of continuous uh, making, and and I just want to hear your 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 thoughts about that. But I found it to just be incredibly useful. Yes, in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> so, notwithstanding the the current times, I've yes. been kind of living this way since like August of last year. Um, mm -hmm. So I've spent a great deal of time in my own home. Um, I've basically only seen a couple of other people. It's been an interesting kind of semi quarantine experience in that own right. And um, coming to deal with how to fill your time and how. To stave off like the inevitable um sorts of cabin fever and ferility that come with all of this stuff <laughs> making stuff is is really really good right um yeah. i i use the word meditation or meditative process um because for me it sort of literally is that uh, i've since very young age for health related reasons have had to um engage in things like self hypnosis and meditation and while I don't have like a Buddhist background or anything like that, I'm um, well experienced in sort of like the uh, in proper meditation and, and in inducing trance in the self and things like that. Uh, for a period of time, I did um, Tai Chi when I was in high school, and one of the ideas in there was a couple ideas in Tai Chi and in Taoism that really. Um, have held through for me and one of them is the idea of constant moving meditation so when you're doing tai chi even though you're moving what you're doing is you're meditating um and the idea that you can sort of practice this all of the time mm -hmm. so um i sort of live my life generally speaking as much as i can in a way that is um not to say meditative because i don't think really gets the right idea across 
but is um, based on an idea of trying to keep the mind calm and to try to control the initial response to stimulus and then make a decision that I actually want to make instead of just whatever like my weird animal brain wants to do at the moment. Yeah. Um, and a big part of that is the ability to keep your mind quiet. Um, if mm -hmm. and it doesn't work for everybody, it works really well for me. But um, and that's referred to sometimes as like no mind or um, on duality or things like that. And I find a great deal of comfort in that because I've used it as that sort of state of mind as a tool to um, self-soothe throughout most of my existence. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I go to my garage studio space, I have it set up relatively as nicely as it can be. It's not, you know, it's, it's a retrofitted garage. Um, it doesn't have shelving or anything. It needs paint. It's amazing, but it is set up nicely and there's nice light and I can get music going and I can be in an environment that is relatively peaceful mm -hmm. and I can start to engage with doing something and in doing so I will engage with that pretty much like a hundred I don't think about the coronavirus I don't think about my anxieties I yeah. don't think about any of this other stuff I think about what I'm doing yeah. and um, I derive a great deal of peace and satisfaction out of that it will allow several hours in the day to pass where I don't have to be in a state of anxiety Anxiety, where I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do, where I don't have to have anxieties about not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like instead of doing all that, I can just go make something. And I have spent a great deal of my life um, prior to these sort of more major transformations recently chasing a idea of perfection that is very Western, where things are shiny and lines are crisp and things are just so. And um, that is a nice aesthetic in its own right but it is a uh not really what i'm trying to do anymore and in sort of a sort of preconceived notion of what something should be just kind of burn on the fire i can um create something with the knowledge that it's not going to be this masterpiece that we were talking about it's going to be a learning piece that's going to be really more about me developing the feel with the chisels all of that but i can still treat it with the same level of respect and intensity that I would as though it were, you know, a proper piece or whatever, because I'm there to do business. I'm there to learn. I'm there to interact with the wood and with the chisel and to make something. And even though, as it is now, it's seldom exactly what I set out to do, and hopefully, to a certain extent, never will be, um, along the way, my I gouge the wood less with the chisel. I bite in less with the skew. You know, I, I do a better job of making beads and coves. My forms get better better they get more you know my uh, willingness to be daring with the material gets better and so as a consequence i get yeah. better lines i get better forms more interesting things start to happen and all that it's taken is just me getting up and going to the studio and have yep. a native experience and detaching from the outcome yeah um so that's sort of what it, it is for me and now I, I think a lot of people refer to that in the moment feeling as flow uh, is that the way that yeah, you flow see it? Okay, yeah. term. No, um, I I conceptualize it um, in the more Buddhist sense of no mind. Um, so the mind is empty except for the thing that we're working on. There's not uh, there's not two minds going on at the same same time. I learn and worrying about coronavirus. I'm not necessarily even. Um, concerned too terribly much with the self other than like the feedback of the hands and the chisel and everything it's like the um hmm. no i think that that's a good way to put it is the that you just turn your you, you turn your brain off to allow it to concentrate on that feedback on that because really yeah you just sort of just like closed loop you can, robots yeah, and what it is is it's basically saying like, okay, that loop is fine, but it can go get dealt with by the subconscious, and I'm going to just not talk to myself, and I'm not going to worry about that stuff, and it's not really even so much making the decision consciously, it's just like that's what the outcome ends up being, it's just like, I'm just going to do this thing right now, and that is the same as just sitting there and not worrying or not thinking or meditating or whatever. It's also the same as going on a walk to clear your mind. Yeah. You know, these are all sort of similar ideas. It's just about the level of um, how you interact with them. Yes. 
and when you recognize for a moment it's like uh, some people get this my father gets this playing guitar you know like you said that sort of flow um the satori there's other words i've heard for it um but just the idea that you're engaged with what it is you're doing a hundred percent or you know whatever other cliche way you want to put it but the other stuff falls away you're not doing that stuff you're doing this thing that's in front of you now you're interacting with it and um i find a great deal of joy in that you know the uh, one of the other places that i find that like i mentioned earlier with martial arts is in sparring you don't have time to think you don't really have a whole lot of time to plan until you've gotten really, really good at things and you're engaged in this action where things are happening really fast yeah. and you're re responding and yep. if you're thinking you're getting hit and if you're responding <laughs> you're doing okay <laughs> <laughs> that's one way to look at it uh i mean i guess that goes with a lot of craft things too if you stop paying attention to a table saw it will bite it will bite you it will bite you. The table saw is the wrong place to get a creative flowing line going. But if you're careful and you're working on a bandsaw and you've done it a lot, now you can get something really interesting happening. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's something that um, even if you make relatively poor objects, the experience of making them is, I think that it is meditative to most people. Um, some people will sit and just do coloring books. Uh, that's been a really popular thing in the last few years is adult coloring books that are just really complicated oh, yeah. coloring books. And it is just that thing that allows you to kind of just put all of your attention into a an act as opposed to staying inside of your head. Um, and I think that's really positive yeah, for a lot of people. I agree. And also just like from a... Um a craft sort of appreciation angle of it there's a lot of different ideas of beauty i mean if you go and look at the more eastern ideas of it like uh, the, the tea masters the, um and the appreciation for like korean and chinese pottery that uh, is shown a lot in in the east a lot of those pots if you go and look at them are exceedingly beautiful but not in the way that an average westerner would conceive of beauty yeah you know interesting questions to ask yourself if you go and look at that stuff and try to figure out why it's as prized as it is given our culture's appreciation of things. Yeah, we have discussions in class on um, some of the concepts of wabi-sabi and uh, imperfections oh, yeah. in objects. And um, that's a really interesting and probably an entirely separate conversation. Uh, do you want to go into yes. do you want to go into that sort of um, imperfection? I, in terms of my own work? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's, um, but, you know, like, within these topics, once again, you have to be careful because it's the, you don't want to necessarily imitate that, you know, but the idea we were talking before about um, the bowl that stands out is because of the whole wabi-sabi idea, you know, is that bowl have this idea of uh, loneliness? Does this bowl have something that's speaking to you? Is it evoking something greater than what, you know, a, the bowl sitting next to it? Um, those kinds of things are really interesting to me, and I'm, I want to learn how to, not how to replicate that, but how to make objects that have a chance of exhibiting that. Um, and so that, once again, craft being interesting to me, the importance of making things, you know, being sort of fundamental to my my philosophy is that you know that's the hope is is that it's not going to happen this year it's not, not going to happen next year it's certainly not going to happen you know within the next five years but maybe sometime down the line uh the things that are on my my shelf are going to be things that might actually have some um larger value than the object that they're an homage to uh, originally served that being said i'm committed to the fact that if i make a beautiful bowl and you want to eat soup out of it that it will serve that function yeah uh, and I think that that's a really interesting um, thing. One, and, and, and just to just to clarify for people listening, if you don't understand the word wabi-sabi, one, you should look it up because it's a very complicated topic that I'm not going to get into today. But um, the, yes. the basic takeaway is soul, is that an object has soul. Um, and, or I guess that that's the, that's the way that I would look at it, is that the object kind of has soul. It has experiences, it has a life of its own outside of you. Um, and I think that that's a really yeah. interesting thing. And, and you're right that there are a lot of things that try to imitate 
that, that try to imitate this sort of handcrafted uh -huh. error in order to get closer to that. But it's really not the error that you're looking for. It's the fact that those errors were... Somebody tried to avoid those errors and they're still there. And that right. gives interest. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think that that's something that also, um, again, when you're starting out in a craft, it doesn't have to be perfect. It, you, don't, you don't have to be perfect because somebody can tell that you put work into it. And we have this concept in food all the time, right? Like the food your grandma made, made you is good not because she was a trained chef. It's because she loves you, right? Like there's, a, there's this... We know about this idea. We just know about it in different ways. Like a little, I completely agree. Yeah, a little kid draws you a picture. It's not the best picture, but it's got soul. Um, right. It, the, the child has made something that is totally authentic to what they were trying to do. It's like the um, the idea that because the, the image is perhaps primitive in its technique, that it somehow is invalid. Yeah, and that's just honestly not the case most of the time. The things that we remember the things that we um, have positive experiences with are very often things that are flawed that are not perfect absolutely and are just full full of soul they have right it's like they have character like uh, you and i both like working with wood to a certain extent but i mm -hmm. don't want clear wood i don't you know i'm not looking to avoid knots i'm not looking for you know i'd like something interesting i'd like a, a piece of wood where the tree got struck by a lightning at some point and it grew back over i would like some tree you know something that has some more soul to it than just a 20 foot tall um toothpick straight pine tree yeah i don't know for two which by isn't fours, to say I'll that that's that. a bad <laughs> well two by fours is one thing but building yeah. something you know furniture is another yep um all right well i think that a good place to stop is right there that as people are sitting at home with not much to do there is plenty to do and you don't have to pick up a craft in order to make a job of it or something like that. Sometimes it can just bring you peace or just make you happy for a few minutes or just be fun to do. Or if you're lucky, you'll get good things out. Uh, and I think that's a really good place to stop. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Max. Uh, it's, been a, it's been lovely talking to you this morning. And uh, I will talk to you later. All right, Wyndham. Have a good one. Thanks, man. Peace.